Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. We're so glad that you're here to join us. Is it just me or is it that I see so much on TV now and TV news that it is so depressing and so horrible to see? Is it just me? I mean, sometimes it is just too hard to bear some of the stuff that we see on TV news. It just feels like we really need to have a little more kindness in the world. But how do we show kindness? How do we teach our kids to be kind and empathetic toward other people? Or do we even want to teach them how to do that? I can tell you, I am not an expert in any of that, but I know who is. She is a licensed psychologist and the clinical manager for Cook Children's Psychology Clinic in Denton, Texas. Please welcome Dr. Lisa Elliott. Difficult and sometimes painful experiences often become the stories and the life lessons that we learn from. Just as the passage in Proverbs that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We can use those experiences to help us grow and become better people, but we can also use them to share and help others. With that in mind, I'd like to share with you a very short but powerful story that illustrates three valuable life lessons. And really, these are the principles that guide me as a psychologist, a neuropsychologist, a mom, a wife, and a family member, but also a coworker and a friend. The story is about Thomas Edison, who happened to be one of our century's greatest inventors. Edison was a very poor student. He struggled actually both academically and behaviorally. His schoolmaster had referred to him as idle minded This infuriated his mother, who herself was a trained educator. So she made the decision to remove him from school and to teach him herself. Upon her death, Edison was quoted as saying, my mother was the making of me. She was so sure, so true of me, that I knew I had someone to live for, someone I could not disappoint. We have all had different experiences and people in our life who have helped shape and define who we are. In large part, who I am today is due to those experiences and the many wonderful people who have poured into my life, sharing these three life lessons. So let me begin with the first one. The first life lesson is a message about significance. I believe every single person is vital and valuable in this world. I don't believe God makes mistakes. I think every single person is this beautiful mosaic of so many wonderful strengths and blessings, but also weaknesses. And we have to become aware of those strengths so we know how to use those to help others. But it also helps us to identify our purpose in life. And I believe we all have a purpose. I think also awareness of our weaknesses Help us to kind of create more openness and willingness to receive help from others. We need to embrace and be grateful for all these individual differences. We need to see people who are different from us, whether that be gender, whether that be race, whether that be social economic status, whether that be educational level, whether that be cultural or ethnic and religious reasons, whether it's for political affiliations, whether it's a child with some kind of learning disability or or any kind of disability or medical condition. We need to see every single one of them as valuable and worthy. I would say a good percentage of my patient population are children we have identified as either neurodiverse or neuroatypical. These are our children who have had some kind of cognitive impact due to like a medical condition, such as strokes or seizures or traumatic brain injuries. It also includes our children who have either had exposure to drugs in utero or possibly genetic anomalies. These are our children who have had learning disabilities and even maybe on the autism spectrum. And what's so difficult is invariably these precious children will tell me that they have no worth, no value, They don't know their purpose in this world. They wish they had not been born. That is heart-wrenching. 
So my time is spent helping them understand their strengths and their purpose and their value. They're insightful. They have more tolerance of other people. They're compassionate and empathetic, and they give back. And that's what we need more of. It is my honest opinion that I believe that God's ultimate goal was for us to live in community, loving and helping each other. In fact, can you imagine this world without some of Edison's inventions? If his mother had allowed him to believe he was idle-minded, which that in and of itself is such a cruel and humiliating narrative anyway, but it would have impacted his self-esteem and potentially his, his outcomes and what he contributed to the world. And that leads me to the second valuable life lesson. <clears throat> it's a message of empathy and kindness. I am gravely concerned about the lack of kindness and empathy we have in our culture today. We are bombarded with violence and hatred and just overall meanness. It's almost like our news media, it's, too much, it's almost too much to bear to watch. Watching all these stories of children and adolescents and adults either assaulting one another, killing each other, or bullying one another. And what's sad is this anger and, and humility, I mean, this anger and, and just meanness, this horrible culture of violence, it's not just depicted in our news. We see it in our TV shows, our movies, our music, our video games. It's all over social media. It's in our schools and our jobs. We see it on roads with road rage, and we even see it with daily human interactions. It's kind of almost like we have got an empathy deficit disorder, like we've lost our moral compass of how we're supposed to treat one another. Recently, there have been several studies that have validated that the majority of American citizens, regardless of age, believe that there is a deficit or a decline in empathy and kindness in our culture, even our business leaders. And what's really interesting is that empathy is actually the foundational cornerstone for both moral intelligence and emotional intelligence. Empathy is the ability to understand someone else's perspective and feelings without having to compromise our own. Empathy is what creates a civilized society. Empathy is what controls um, violence and cruelty. And empathy is also what allows for this emotional and relational connectivity. Recent research in neuroscience has shown that empathy is actually hardwired, that children have the capacity to be born with it. And while empathy may occur early, naturally, it does have to be nurtured and developed. Focusing on teaching healthy character traits, like kindness and good citizenship and caring for one another and just integrity help promote and develop that empathy, but it also helps to promote resiliency. Recently, at a commencement exercise, Jake Tapper from CNN spoke to his audience about kindness. And what he said was this, mean is easy, mean is lazy, mean is self-satisfied, mean is slothful. You want to know what's hard? Being kind, being respectful, and being patient. I agree with Tapper. We have got to place a higher priority on empathy and kindness. And then that leads me to my third and final message from this story. And that's a message regarding the significance and value of resiliency. Because Edison had one person, his mother, who valued him and recognized his significance and who supported him with kindness and empathy, he was able to overcome these academic challenges and he excelled giving back to this world. That's resiliency. Resiliency is a hot topic in my industry and I think in others as well. And there's several reasons for this, but I'd like to be able to share with you two research reasons for this. One, our new recent research in neuroscience has shown the harm that toxic stress has on a developing brain. And resiliency helps mitigate that. The other one was the release of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, known as the ACE study. This study revealed the correlation between stressful, traumatic experiences that occur in childhood and how that impacts or results in the negative impact of the long-term toxic stress has on adults 
in terms of our health, our mental health, and our emotional well-being. What Dr. Folletti and his team did, as well as the CDC, they identified 10 traumatic experiences that if an individual endorses four or more of those, they're more likely to have greater risk of health problems as an adult. And those can include such things as heart disease, diabetes, and stroke. It can also include greater risk for mental health problems, such as depression and anxiety. But it also means their overall well-being is not as effective either in terms of their coping skills and relationships and jobs. Further, if that score is even higher than a four, it can result in shortened life span, and not only that, if it's six or more possible suicide risk. And while all of that is very overwhelming and alarming, great news came from that also, hopeful news. News that resiliency helps mitigate those outcomes. Resiliency is the ability to bounce back and overcome difficult challenges and adversities and even our own poor decisions. And what it entails is the ability to effectively cope with, manage, and adapt to that stress. So the two things that you need to have to develop resiliency is the presence of protective factors as well as learning healthy coping tools. If you have those, not only is your coping more effective, but you will build resiliency. So protective factors are those skills or supports or resources that are either within the individual, within their family, or their community that helps them deal with stressful and traumatic situations. What has been some of the most promising and hopeful news of all is that we know that the single most important protective factor for children to develop resiliency is just the presence of just one loving, committed, and stable adult in their life. And that could be a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, or even just a, a caretaker. It doesn't have to be just one person. The other great news from that is, is that we know that building resiliency at any age, whether it's eight or if it's 50, results in positive outcomes. So a lot of my therapeutic time is spent teaching my patients, as well as my, um, their parents, how to foster resiliency. That includes focusing on teaching mindfulness skills and effective problem-solving strategies and coping tools. It also means focusing on how to engage in perspective-taking, like how to see other positions as well as how to reframe situations and nurture that optimism. It also means focusing on helping them identify their strengths so they see their value and their worth and their significance. I had mentioned earlier that we've all had experiences as well as people in our lives that have helped define us. And I was very blessed to have more than one protective factor. But my most critical protective factor was my paternal grandmother, so it didn't even have to be a parent. The, the final words I'd like to leave with you on this is, is this. Our words matter. Our actions matter. How we treat our patients and our families, how we treat our own children and our family members, how we treat our coworkers and our friends, and even how we treat state strangers is absolutely critical. It all matters. We have to be the center of that change. We have to be the core that changes. So I'm leaving you with some challenges today. Be that person who is a child's single most important protective factor. Be that person who embraces and values diversity and recognizes every single person is significant. Be that person who exhibits and shows kindness and compassion and empathy, and by doing so, you're modeling it for others. Be that person who teaches resiliency and models resiliency. Be that person who helps support and nurture children to be kind and compassionate to themselves as well as to others. And finally, be that person that raises an I care kid. Lisa, thank you for that encouragement. 
thank you for those words of wisdom and thank you for just reminding us that kindness does matter. You mentioned Edison and he had one person in his life, his mother, that was that yes. protective factor. And then you also mentioned that your paternal grandmother was your protective factor. Tell me a little bit more about her. Well, she's a very amazing, she was a very amazing woman. I would think that she, I see her probably as my earthly angel. Mm when I was growing up. Um, she's very wise, emotionally wise, intelligent, and incredibly classy. And she had a difficult life herself. My grandfather, her husband, was killed when my dad was five. And what was probably the hardest thing for her was watching my biological father, her oldest son, um, make really poor decisions that impacted and hurt a lot of people. Mm -hmm. He, my early childhood was filled with him being an alcoholic, and there was lots of abuse, verbal mm -hmm. and emotional and physical abuse and violence. And um, probably the narrative that hurt the most for me was to hear at age eight years of age that um, he was leaving us because my sister and I were both girls, that girls were not as worthy and important as boys. Mm -hmm. But this woman, mm -hmm. this beautiful woman, made sure that we knew we were significant mm -hmm. and worthy and valuable. Mm -hmm. She didn't abandon us. She filled us with lots of unconditional love, made sure we had experiences that we needed to have, but she modeled resiliency without us even knowing that that was what it was. Oh, and um, so she left me with just, um, you know, for love of education that we could divine who we wanted to be and be anything we wanted to be, for my love of anything coffee, <laughs> and even peonies, <laughs> but she also, in my faith. So she was a pretty remarkable woman. Wow. Tell me how you see kindness in your own life. I know you, as a clinical psychologist, you see the, the kids who come in and they're, they're in despair and they're mm. not, their hope is lagging and, and things are not, you know, really good in their lives when they first come to see you. But how do you see kindness in your own life? Well, fortunately, I have the amazing blessing of getting to see the change that happens with my kiddos I work with and seeing them recognize their mm. strengths. Yeah. And when they have that sense of competence, yeah. they tend to be more kind and they want to be more generous with that, those yeah. skills. But I think from a personal perspective, you know, for, for anyone who ever wants to be a parent, for me, it's the biggest blessing and the biggest privilege and honor to be a parent, but it's mm -hmm. also challenging and frightening. Mm -hmm. And so you hope and pray that your children will be kind and empathetic. And, um, you know, I can sit back now and I see my children, my 22-year-old daughter and my 25-year-old son, fulfilling your hopes and dreams in terms of giving back to people. Mm -hmm. um, can I share a couple of those? Sure, sure. Okay. So my youngest, my daughter, 22, she is a chemical engineer major, and she mm -hmm. is in a, her, she'll be in her fifth year next year. Um, my husband's very anxious for her to graduate so she can be off the payroll. Um, but anyway, she, even though she's an engineer major, mm -hmm. she and three, two other students have created this um, Aggie Mental Health Ambassador Organization wow. with the goal, they have their own, they do have, their organization is approved, they have a mission statement, they have their bylaws and everything, mm -hmm. but their goal is to increase awareness of mental health, help destigmatize mental health, mm -hmm. help educate and provide training for people on their campus, mm -hmm. but then also helping to empower people to seek mm -hmm. the help that they need to have. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, I mean that just yeah. makes my heart yeah. so warm to he my own chemical engineer major caring about mental health. Yes. Yes. And then my 25 year old, whose ultimate goal was to, you know, he graduated with a business honors and a finance major, but he was ultimately wanting to go into consulting and finance. Mm -hmm. But he found his way into Teach for America. Mm. Do you know what that is? No. It's an organization that places teachers in very marginalized environments, whether that's rural or whether it's um, like in big cities. Mm -hmm. And he taught ninth grade math as well as coached basketball for a very rural community in North Carolina. Mm. And these children come from very difficult challenges, oftentimes coming to school hungry. Mm. And now he's actually, he was recruited to be, get his master's in school administration. And now he is actually going to be assistant principal at one of the schools over there in North Carolina. Wow. And he loves giving back to these kids. Wow. They, those are his passion. Wow. 
Well, that must be really fulfilling as it a is. parent to see that they're carrying on the things that you taught them. But help me understand, how do you teach empathy? particularly when you may not necessarily feel that you're empathetic yourself, seeing yourself in someone else's shoes, seeing somebody else's perspective. How do you teach your kids to be empathetic? Well, Winnie, what you just said is actually what you do, is you teach perspective taking. You know, oftentimes we get caught up in what we think something is mm -hmm. without really considering how that situation may be for somebody else. Right. And so the goal is to help them in, you know, pull back from just what their needs are, or what they think some things are, and actually think about how it may apply or what may be different or contributing to that situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then changing and adjusting your behavior with that in mind, that different perspective in mind. Mm -hmm. Also, the other thing that, that helps with empathy and kindness is seeing it modeled giving back to people all the time. And it doesn't have to be just necessarily with volunteer work, but being kind to someone, just saying hello, can I help you with something? Mm -hmm. that's, that's how you do that. You know, a lot of people probably are looking for uh, big, massive movements, you know, making a sign, going out in the streets, trying to change things in that manner. Mm -hmm. But what you're explaining to me is more about looking in the mirror and saying, what can I I do to do something to That's, change. And you are, you've hit it just perfectly. We do think there has to be these movements. But in reality, the change actually starts with each of us. Mm -hmm. How we treat our family, how we treat our coworkers, how we treat the people that we encounter in our, in our work, how we treat strangers. Mm -hmm. We have to be the one to look in the mirror and see that we are the ones who can facilitate that change, just in the smallest actions. Mm -hmm. You've encouraged me to be better on the road. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those drivers. So you've encouraged me now to be kinder. Let that person in. I don't, we've all got places to yes. go. <laughs> but now to be kinder and um, to be more empathetic when I'm on the, on the streets and behind the wheel. Thank you so much for that encouragement. I appreciate it. Thank you.